follow us today carry computers. In fact, in our pockets, we all have a smartphone, which is a powerful version of the computer IBM researchers started building back in the 1940s. Back in the day, computers used to be the size of a whole building. So whenever you wanted to turn on this computer, all the city lights would flicker. That's the type of equipment that back then we started calling the initial computers. That type of computer is less powerful than today's smartphones we all carry. Whether we talk about these large computers, PCs that became popular in the 80s, or smartphones that became popular in the 2010s, all of them rely on the same architecture, which we will call classical computing. All these computers rely on transistors, small devices, switches that could be turned off, which will lead to a value zero, or turned on, which will lead to a value one. At the end of the day, any of these devices only understand zeros and ones, even the powerful GPUs used to train generative AI model that can create this image. However, a new architecture is on the way. It's actually in development today, and that's called quantum computing. It is a new architecture that will leverage zeros, ones, and all the values in between. That capability will transform many areas of human activity, solving problems that up to now only had approximate solutions requiring less calculation time. Now, these type of computers will have a lot of applications. So that's the reason why, for the last years, you might have read a lot about it on the press. That being said, sometimes the literature about quantum computing really doesn't recognize its potential limitations. It doesn't mean that in a decade from now, all of us will throw away our smartphones or PCs to use a quantum computer. That's not exactly the case. Quantum computers will be great for certain types of problems, but not all, meaning that in the future, quantum computers and classical computers will coexist. We will get the best of both worlds. So no wonder major technology companies all over the world are after this technology. In fact, giants in America, Europe, and Asia are trying to come up with the best approach to leverage this new technology. It's not that easy. Let's remember, when we developed classical computers, there were also different attempts to create the optimal computer. Today, we build fast semiconductors. These semiconductors that you are carrying in your phones have more than 16 billion transistors today. That's a huge development. To get there, trial and error is the way. In the same way, the stage of development of quantum computing today is comparable to the 40s or 50s when we started building the first classical computers. We can all light up a candle to illuminate the room and you can say you can get a better candle to get more light in the room. That doesn't mean that working to get better illumination for the room by building a better candle, you will get a light bulb. It's a completely different technology. Equally, when you think about bicycles, the best bicycle manufacturers in the world won't be able to manufacture a car. That's the type of qualitative difference that exists between classical computers and quantum computers. Even though both will be helpful to solve difficult problems and have great applications, they are different. And the technology that makes great classical computers will need to be improved, actually changed to create ideal conditions to develop quantum computers. For example, when you think 
of a computer, of a smartphone, these types of devices work in any temperature. It could be very cold outside or very hot. Nonetheless, your computer or smartphone will work with no problem. In the case of quantum computers, because we rely on a new type of bit we will call a quantum bit, we need to control interference in qubits. And for that, we need to be in an environment that is going to be extremely cold. These chips will need to work at temperatures almost close to zero Kelvin, which is pretty much an environment that is going to be coldest point in the universe. That's the narrow condition that needs to be created for a quantum computer to take advantage of special properties and solve very difficult problems. With traditional computers, we use bits. And these bits can be zero and one. It's been said that if you want to create a smartphone, you can actually create one with billions of young children, 16 billion children in kindergarten, who only know how to add zeros and ones. That's what computers can be compared with. Because these computers, as intelligent as they are, processing videos, images, and everything else, these computers will only understand zeros and ones. So these classical bits work great with classical computers. However, when you think about quantum computers, we have to think about qubits, quantum bits, which will have more values, not only the zeros and ones of the classical world, but also any combination of zeros and ones. This is a property that will allow us to solve different types of problems, and that's also very difficult to configure. Now, the behavior of qubits being zero, one, or any combination was very puzzling from the beginning. The quantum computing field that we discussed today was actually studied already for 90, 80 years. Many of the major fields in physics have already discovered the main properties that we take advantage of today. However, it was very puzzling back then, and it still is. Nevertheless, it shouldn't be, because you and I are quantum objects. A tennis ball is a quantum object. An electron is a quantum object. However, if I throw the tennis ball to the wall, I expect that tennis ball to come back to me. On the other hand, if I have an electron and I throw the electron to the wall, the electron might end up on the other side of the wall, come back to me, or be anywhere. In other words, I will never know where it is. In the case of the tennis ball, I know where it is. It is a big object, so the properties of classical physics work there. That doesn't mean it's not a quantum object. It is just that it's much bigger than protons and neutrons. And indeed, thanks to technology today, we are able to demonstrate that these properties are indeed followed by these particles at the microscopic level. Now, if you think about classical systems, we're going to talk about two bits. For example, in the classical world, we have one bit that can be zero or one. Another bit can also be zero or one. So if you have two of them, the different combinations will be zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. To be able to describe this system, I will only need two pieces of information because I have two bits. In the case of the quantum world, even though we will only have two qubits, these will exhibit special properties. So that means that these qubits can also be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. However, at any given time, a quantum system with two qubits will actually be a little bit of 0, 0, a little bit of 0, 1, a little bit of 1, 0, and a little bit of 1, 1. That means if there are four different states, I will need to have four values to be able to describe a quantum system with only two qubits. For a system in the classical world that only manages two bits, we need two values. On the other hand, if I have a quantum system that has two qubits, we will need four values which can be stored and processed. 
this will just give you an initial idea of how much more powerful a quantum computer can be. Equally, if we have a system with three bits in the classical world, these values are all I need. On the other hand, if I'm looking at a quantum system with three qubits, the same piece of information now in the quantum world, I will need to have actually eight values to describe the system. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on, all the way to 1, 1, 1. Because a quantum system will actually exhibit all these different states at the same time. A little bit of 0, 0, 0, a little bit of 0, 0, 1, on and on and on, and a little bit of 1, 1, 1, meaning we will need eight values. So in the classical world, I need only three values or n values to describe a system. In the quantum world, I will need eight values or two elevated to the nth power. It was Richard Feynman, one of the greatest physicists in the last century, who came up with the idea of employing these incredible properties of the quantum world to design a computer. What he wanted to do was to simulate molecules. And of course, let's think about water. Water is everywhere. In fact, you and I are 70% water, a quantum object. He wanted to create a simulation of simple molecules. And he realized soon enough that for a classical computer, that would be a very difficult task. Because if you think about molecules, you think about different components there. So you have neutrons, protons, and electrons. If you want to simulate the behavior of these molecules, you need to account for all the interactions of every single element of this system with all the other elements. It sounds simple, but the number of interactions grows exponentially, making it very difficult for classical computers to simulate them perfectly. The suggestion was, if the world is quantum and we try to simulate the world, why don't we get a computer that can take advantage of these rare behaviors? And that was indeed what he proposed. However, he wasn't the first to do so. Just a year before, a couple of renowned scientists, Paul Benioff and Yuri Manning, had suggested that idea. And that was the beginning of a revolution, because from then on, scientists realized this was another paradigm. And that meant that we had to develop these new type of computers that would be able to leverage these strange properties and surely enough would give us new capabilities. Simulating molecules, for example. Even penicillin, a very popular drug we all use, it looks like a very simple molecule, yet, it's impossible for a classical computer to simulate. The groundbreaking proposals from these renowned scientists actually gave birth to the field that we call today quantum computing. But how is it possible that a qubit can be zero, one, or any combination of this? Let's assume that we have a coin and we throw it up in the air. When the coin is spinning up in the air, would you know if the coin will end in a head or tail, zero or one? We don't know. At that moment, we don't know what's going to be its final state. Yet, when the coin finally drops on the table, we will certainly see if this is a zero or a one. We can state that from the moment I throw the coin up in the air until the moment when the coin falls into the table, the coin will display a property called superposition, meaning that in those moments, the coin will be expected to be 0, 1 or any combination. That's a key property that allows us to leverage quantum computers today. Now, physically, to be able to create these qubits, we can use electrons, we can use ions, we can use photons, different technologies. We still don't know what's going to be the dominant approach to create the optimal quantum computer. Not important property in the quantum world is entanglement. By that, we need a unique characteristic. If we have two qubits and you apply a laser, you will be able to see that you can connect these qubits 
So the values of these qubits will be correlated no matter how far they are. This was demonstrated decades ago practically, and now even more so. Scientists have been able to separate qubits for a thousand kilometers and realize that indeed, if for some reason one of the qubits is going to be interfered with, the other qubit, which is entangled with the first, will reflect that same impact. Entanglement was discovered, of course, more than 90 years ago. Even Albert Einstein, when he realized the extent of this property, was puzzled. He called it spooky action at a distance. Today, this has been demonstrated and it's one of the two most important properties that we leverage in quantum computing. Let's bring the topic of chess because it's a wonderful game and there is a story out there about how this game was created. Apparently, a very wise advisor to an Indian king saw that he was bored and came up with this interesting game. The king was very impressed and he asked him, how should I compensate you for this creation? The very clever advisor came up with this plan. You can give me, your majesty, one grain of rice for the first cell of this 8 by 8 board. You give me two for the second, four for the next one, A, 16, 32, 64, and so on. When the king heard this request, he was puzzled. How come you asked me for such a little thing? I wanted to pay you something more significant. Yet, it took a couple of days for the advisors to come back to the king to conclude that it would be virtually impossible to satisfy this requirement because not even an amount of rice of the size of the Mount Everest would be enough to pay this unique request. That's the power of exponentials. And that's the power we can handle today leveraging quantum technology. Before, when I gave an example of a classical system with only two bits, two values were all we could handle. On the other hand, in the quantum world, we will leverage four values. Equally, in a system with three qubits, we can actually leverage eight values. In a system with four qubits, we will handle 16 values and so on. So that's why it becomes so relevant for us to think about complicated problems with quantum computers. Have you heard about the traveling salesman problem? It is a problem that many students in PhD programs around the world still try to work around. Because even though it's a problem that has been known for many years, there is no optimal solution, only approximations. And we're always in search of classic algorithms to solve this problem in a more efficient way. Comes along quantum computing. The problem is that we need to find the optimal route for a salesman who wants to visit many different cities in a certain geography. So when you think about a number of four cities, the number of routes would be three. A classical computer might only need one third of a millisecond to solve this problem. If you think about more cities, five cities, the number of routes grows to 12 and a classical computer will solve it in one millisecond. However, you can see very quickly that if we grow the number of cities to 10, 15, 20, the number of routes grows exponentially. Therefore, the capability of a classical computer to solve this problem becomes drastically reduced. How much time a computer would need, for example, if we think about 20 cities? If we have 20 cities, the number of paths will be in the trillions, quadrillions, quintillions and the time required for the classical computer to find the ideal route after seeing all the potential options, it's going to be 193 millennia. So none of us will be able to see that solution in a reasonable time frame. This is a typical hard problem for classical computers. On the other hand, a quantum computer can provide a dramatic speed up when we try to solve this particular challenge. Now, for classical computers trying to solve this problem, this will have to go through all the different solutions, all the possible solutions, and then calculate what's going to be the optimal solution. That requires a lot of computing power. On the other hand, 
we can design a quantum system that in minutes or in seconds properly choreographed will be able to reach the most probable solution. So it's not evaluating all these different routes. It's actually going straight to the most probable solution. That methodology is something we can not only use for this type of problem, but many more types of optimization problems. And we're only now at the beginning stage to see the full application of this technology. The properties of quantum computing are so unique that it's even difficult to find a problem where we can compare the advantage of a quantum computer versus a classical computer. In very specific situations, researchers have been able to demonstrate that superiority, that supremacy, that advantage. There was a very theoretical problem that was structured for a classical computer. When I talk about a classical computer, I don't mean a laptop. I mean supercomputers that are used to predict the weather. For example, even powerful supercomputers working on these theoretical problems will take thousands of years to equal the performance of a quantum computer, which can actually solve it in only seconds or minutes. Certainly, we have now already demonstrated the advantages of the quantum approach over the classical approach. Now, it's time to apply these capabilities to real life problems. These opportunities will come once we are able to optimize these quantum computers. We're getting there, but the capabilities of the prototypes that have been developed already are still very limited. We expect this development to take a decade or so. Today, if you go online for a bank transaction, you will need to enter your username and password. Once that's completed, the communication between you and your bank will be encrypted. Guess what? That encryption relies on factorization. That is something very difficult to do at the moment, which is the reason why we use this approach. It's very easy to calculate what are the prime factors of 21, 3, and 7. However, if I ask you to give me the prime factors of a number that is going to be 100 digits long, even for big computers, it's very difficult. So difficult that we use this approach to encrypt online communications. So imagine what happened a few decades ago when Peter Shore, an MIT scientist, discovered an algorithm that would allow quantum computers to calculate the prime factors of very large numbers. If we are able to build a computer that execute this algorithm, we'll be able to decrypt these communications, potentially creating a big problem for a world that relies on this type of encryption. So of course, you will tell me, we hopefully will find a better way to encrypt our communications. Quantum computers will actually allow us to do so too. In the same way that quantum computers are able to decrypt communications that are protected, it will also give us a way to protect these communications using these properties of entanglement and superposition. I would like to point out that if we want to move to the next stage where we're actually using the best of the available technology to improve our organizations, quantum computers should be in our agenda. I mentioned before that these computers are still not available. Prototypes are available with limited capabilities to the cloud. However, the research to create algorithms to solve real current problems should be started now. Many large organizations across all industries are already researching applications of this technology to their respective business. So my challenge to you is to use the information that we have shared today and to start deploying this into your industry. Let's start a team that will study the applications that are already available out there and see what type of problems in your organization this technology can be used for. When the time comes when we are able to get access to quantum computers powerful enough to execute these algorithms, we'll be ready to go full speed. We shouldn't expect a last minute to start developing these applications. Thank you very much for the attention. It was a pleasure.